On this episode of Meet the Heroes, we're going to meet a true icon, a car that was once defined as the Widowmaker, and to me, anyway, the ultimate in 80s cool. Good Morgan. Hey, Johnny May. I think that's German for good morning. It is German for good morning. And how very appropriate, because today we're going to see one of my favourite cars. And if I was richer, I'd be buying it. The Porsche 930 Turbo convertible. But oh my God, you're going to be in your element. Oh, mate. With the G50 box, which of course is the box to have. This to me is peak Porsche because you've got impact bumpers, convertible, so questionable dynamics because the cars are a bit floppy. But manual gearbox, wide body, fat foosh on the back, well tail, just, just all the boxes tick for me. Even a nice colour, this one's blue metallic. So this is a car that I'm going to be talking about but actually secretly want to buy throughout the whole of filming today. You've already got one. Well mine isn't a turbo, this is a proper right hand drive turbo. Mine is an SC and a party frock basically. So it looks good. Yeah, yours is flat nose. Mine is well. a flat nose. Yeah, it's cool, but this this is I think is just as cool, but in a different way. But everyone knows the Porsche story, don't they? Obviously, he started with Volkswagen Beetle, Ferdinand Porsche designed and developed that car. Although some say he stole a lot of it from Tatra, controversial. And then of course developed the three five six, and from that became the whole lineage of the nine hundred one, the nine eleven, the nine twelve, and all the cars that came from it. But talk about having one great idea and sticking to it, and just making it work, and developing it and creating greater and greater and greater cars. The 911 is, I think, a bit of genius, and I love the fact it flies in convention of everything else. It doesn't make sense on paper, does it? I love it how the 911 is known as the everyday supercar, yet the 930 Turbo's nickname is Widowmaker. So, how many people daily the 930? There were a lot of people who put them into um, Lamp posts and trees and all the rest of it, which is how it got its name, wasn't it? Well, you've got that whole weight movement, haven't you? You've got a lot of weight transfer because the engine's in the back. It's one of those cars, if you're a little bit on and off the throttle, it does swap ends. But we'll be driving slowly today, I think. Yeah, we're conservative. Always, with a small seat. I think with Porsche, what you do get is that really authentic brand marketing because they are so good at motorsport. It's not just racing for the sake of racing. They genuinely develop the cars on track, don't they? A lot of the motorsport program goes into the road cars. If you look at things like GT3 RS, that's just a race car, isn't it? Yeah. But the brand was, at the very beginning, though, 356s raced, didn't they? Pan America, all that kind of stuff. The brand, they've always raced, even 550 Spiders. Oh, was yeah. it the Berlin Rome rally? That was the first Porsche, wasn't it, basically? The whole streamliner thing. He started as a competition entrant. He started as a motorsport builder that just happened to develop road cars. And that's, to me, the DNA of the brand. That's why I get so excited about Porsches. I think that's why so many other people do. But our timing is beautiful, because did you see, the morning that we're recording this, Singer, for the first time ever that I know of, have done an impact bumper concept. Have you seen it? Yeah, I did. I saw it last night, actually. But isn't that exciting? Because I think that's good to do wonders, both for the image, because a lot of people don't like the impact bumper cars, do they? No, I think it, it was it was one of those that was it was designed for the American market, wasn't it? The the impact bumpers. Yeah, it, it was because of legislation in America, and it went from the skinny chrome bumpers, things like that, and people just didn't warm to it. Now I think they look cool. I think I think they look really cool. But of all those big American spec bumpers, I think Porsche got it more right than any other. Porsche manufacturer. got it right. Mercedes got it wrong. Can you remember on the what was it? The R one hundred seven SLs. Yeah, they yeah. horrendous. Uh, Big really bad rubber though. bumpers. So, how much are the singers starting at? Well, from what I've read, from seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds, which makes this one that we're going to see today at one hundred and ten for a genuine one, right-hand drive turbo in immaculate condition, makes that seem like a bit of a bargain, doesn't it? You could buy six of these for the same price as a brand new singer. That's your logic, isn't it? It is my logic. I do like a singer though, but it. Love. Okay, <laughs> you've got one. Wow. Let's go look at the car. Let's go look at the car. Can we please just take a moment to admire 
for me, this is peak 80s. This is, you know this, you know this is one of my favourite cars. You've got so many models in your office. I know. Of convertible G series. And I don't know what it is because I know as a driver, actually the, the convertible is the compromised car. It's got scuttle shake, it's got a lot of agility, has less integrity than the coupe. But, but it doesn't matter now because performance figures are a thing of the past. Like put a modern day car against this and it'd leave it for dead. It would. This is about looking cool now. But as a kid, all I ever wanted, as a kid, all I ever wanted was a turbo wide-bodied cab. That's all I ever wanted. And that's why I have almost that now. So I have an 82 flat nose wide-body SC, which is, I could, cause I couldn't afford this, but this is very, very- Flat nose is very cool though. It's, well, it's come back around, hasn't it? It's funny because they weren't cool for ages and all of a sudden they're incredibly cool again. But yep. these have always been cool, haven't they? That's the thing. These have always been cool, but the flat bow, which is, the, the flat nose yeah. in Very German. Nice German there, ja. yeah. Flachbau. Yeah. I don't know, maybe that was a bit too yeah. flach. Flachbau. Have you got a cold? <laughs> no. Um. Are you from Wales? <laughs> Which is your favourite generation? I personally think of this, well, I, let's talk about pure 911s, because obviously there are 996s, 997s, 991s, 992s, all great cars, but to me, a, a true 911 is air cooled. And I think if we're talking about air-cooled, obviously the pre-74 cars, I think, have a real beauty. There's a lovely 912 over there. There is, yeah, the 912 here. But um, they're almost too dainty for me. An early 911 or an early 912 is a very beautiful car, particularly in short wheelbase form. And obviously, as someone that adores Beetles, I just think they're a, a very pretty car. Yeah. This is, to me, the 911 at its best. Because after this, of course, came the 964, and they smoothed all the bumpers off. After that came the 993. So if you're looking at a coupe, it's the same glass house. It's the same basic architecture, but they got this right. 1974, they brought out this impact bumper look. I just think they nailed it. I just love them all. I love all of that classic iteration and its many forms that came after. But we should talk about the turbo as well, because the turbo comes out in 1975 and just changes the game forever. But of course, in the 1980s, the 911 wasn't just popular with the public. It was hugely popular in contemporary films. Reference things like No Man's Land with Charlie Sheen, that film has all the 911s. It has an SC, a Targa, a flat nose, and even a 930. Then of course there's Bad Boys, which has the 964 turbo that came later. If you watch the Chuck Norris film, Good Guys Wear Black, that is a cool race film with some of the best Porsches in it. And the 80s film with Julia Roberts, Mystic Pizza, one of the key cars in that is a Porsche 911. And you might have forgotten this one, in Commando, even Schwarzenegger drives one. So you know a bit about Porsche engines. So three litre is the one that they launched with. So they started with three litres, which were 260 brake, and then they moved later on to the 3.3s. Which, which is what then, this is. Which, yeah, and then, so that was up to 300 brake. But they did do some flat nose cars with the WLS performance kit, and that upped it to 330-ish. But the, that was based on the 935 Crema, wasn't it? So well, that's also a great story, isn't it? That the head of Tag Heuer, who sponsored the race team, decided that he wanted a road car that looked exactly like the race cars that he was sponsoring. So he just went to Porsche. And I don't think they had a special wishes department at the time. I said, look, I'm giving you all this money to sponsor your race car. What I'd really like is for you to make my road car look just like that. And they did. And that car still exists, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah. I mean, I always loved the Kremers because they did the famous Apple Mac one, didn't they? Yeah, oh, that's so cool. That is so cool. That was my screensaver. There's a really cool picture of a, one of those in the pits. Really cool. But 911s in the 80s, they were inescapable, weren't they? Particularly if you were anywhere near London. This was the car that every successful broker, yuppie, stockbroker, banker, you name it. If you were doing well in the 1980s, or the 1990s to be fair, you went out and you bought probably this. I'd love to know who the first owner of this car was, because my bet is he was probably some successful London type. <laughs> Don't you reckon? <laughs> yeah. Um, I work in the city, darling. But it was like that, wasn't it? So like kind of your, <laughs> your entry level gateway drug to the Successful yuppie car was Golf TTI, wasn't it? If you did a bit better, maybe you got to an M3, and if you did better than that, you got a 911 Turbo. And yeah. If you're doing really well, you got the cab. The three cars that we love, Golfs, 3 Series, yeah. and 911s. We're, we're both the same. It's so true. It? But this styling though, so you've got the impact bumpers at the front, and we talked about this in the car on the drive-in, didn't we? That is just pure function. It has to work that way to get the federal mandate in America, but they've made it a real design feature. And these bellows, which actually do compress when you squash the bumper, not that you'd want to no. now, <laughs> not, you want to not with the values the way they are. But that bumper, because it's on gas rams, can do that, can't it? It can actually come into the car and no damage will incur to the car. Only a little scuff on your rubber strip. If you look at the front, because you get the lovely, lovely flared 
arch at the front, which is so much more aggressive than the standard car. But this is what I love. But then you get your nine. nine yeah. It's this. It's just this line here. You know when you sit in an old 911 with a wide body conversion, whether it's what well, I've got, flat nose, which has got the intakes, which is even cooler, or this wing, it just looks fantastic in the mirrors, doesn't it? When you look through your rear view mirrors, what you look back and see is this gorgeous, gorgeous hip, yeah. basically. It's got real curves, this car, hasn't it? <clears throat> and that is the appeal of this motor to me. It's really handy, isn't it, to have that car here, that 912, because you can really see the difference that they made in that first iteration change. Because what's crazy is that bonnet, those doors, a lot of the body panels of that car, were this not a convertible, would just swap straight over. So from that train of thought, this is why so many G-series cars were actually backdated. So you look at Singers, they predominantly used the 964 uh, to backdate. That's their chosen car or chassis, if you like, to backdate. Um, but resto mods, so you would take a, an old Carrera or a Turbo and then backdate it so you had more performance because the earlier cars like the, the 912s and the early 911s didn't have a great amount of power, did they? Or that many luxuries. And what I think Singer does that's really, really clever is to take that early pre-impact bumper look, but they put the wide body haunches with it, don't they? Which yeah, you can, mix, never yeah did. you can definitely mix it up. So you can have a narrow bodied car, you can have narrow front wings, but a big old booty, or you can have it all. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they did the pre-impact bumpers, uh, the back days, which look quality. But then you are paying for it, aren't you? It's true. But of course, the idea was that Porsche would say, if you've got a narrow-bodied car, which would be your Carrera or your SC, and then obviously if you had a wide-body car, you'd have a turbo. But of course, the 80s being the 80s, which was a decade of show, wasn't it? You needed to show everybody what you'd got and wasn't necessarily what you actually had. So that's when <laughs> they became the fashion to wide body and normally aspirated cars. So my personal car, which is 1982 Carrera SC cab, really early cab, with a full factory panelled wide body conversion, it's just basically, it's a Carrera in a party frock. Yeah, that's all but it, is. It, it doesn't, as I say, it doesn't matter now, does it? No, it looks like a turbo. But isn't that interesting though? That, and also Porsche did it themselves with the Super Sport, didn't they? So Porsche did offer wide body cars and still do now, today don't they? They still offer certain models occasionally normally aspirated yeah well actually output. funnily enough i know someone with a uh, a yellow super sport coupe yeah with yellow interior Oof. yellow steering wheel yellow dash but it's also got turbo graphics on the rear arches which were from factory were they really yeah so someone pretending yeah but it was a super yeah but i mean that <laughs> car would have been a fortune itself it would the idea behind the turbo body wasn't it was to denote to those of a lesser social standing that you had the top of the range you had the turbo car with the fat haunches with the fat rear tires but the 80s being what the 80s were you could then a market developed for people to get wide body conversions on their normally aspirated car so my car is a great example point so mine's an 82 career um, well sc yeah basically it's an sc 82 normally aspirated left the factory as a narrow bodied car funny enough with a whale tail wishful thinking and then the first owner ordered from um, Germany ordered all the panels to be sent to Alan Johnson Racing, who was Porsche's race team, and they fitted them all up. And that was really common. And what was interesting with the Special Wishes program, the Zondervunch program, is you could get a car that has sometimes gone down the line, has been built as a turbo, and then have it backdated at the factory before it left the factory. So that's why if you get the heritage certificates of certain genuine flat nose cars, they show as a, a normal body, as a normal G series. Oh, do they? Yeah, because a lot of them literally got pulled out the lot, out the compound. But, but it doesn't online. show it on the um, no. certificate of authenticity. No, so a lot of genuine flat nose cars that were delivered to the dealer, brand new as flat nose, actually are on the build sheet and the heritage certificate as a normal decent. I G bet that's raised a few questions from prospective buyers yeah, but, then, but, it, but it's, it's so uh, noted because it's in the original order in some cases. So they're certificated cars with original bill of sale and invoice, where it's, it's shown on the invoice. But the fact you've said in loads of books that you could order that car and in some cases they'd pull one out the lot. Because if you ordered, say, Guards Red, Turbo, they've probably got five sitting there, haven't they, ready yeah. to go? So they'll just bring one in. Of course they have, Guards Red. <laughs> Guards Red, bloody hell, yeah, 930. Why do you think that's so cool? That's so 80s, isn't it, the fact you could do it? But to me, this car is so clever because to sit with this car, which you're talking is a 1960s car that runs all the way into the 90s with key elements in exactly the same place. And but the key yeah. styling really basically unchanged. Yeah, but also technology. Um, so the, the gearbox, for, for example, um, started with the 915 gearbox, but then moved to the G50 for the um, last three years of the Carrera 
production and then the last year for the turbo. So it was only the last year of 930s that actually got the G50. But the G50 actually went, continued because it was that good, went on to be in the 964s and even the 993s, but yeah. it was changed for the water cooled in the 996. But this to me is dream spec because you've got G50 gearbox. I think this is marine blue, this color. Flawless roof. This is a particularly nice car. This one, the roof it? is really good, yeah. I'm going to make a shocking um, observation for you now that I think if it's a narrow body car, it shouldn't have a whale tail. Whale tails or T trays should only be on a wide body car. Discuss. It doesn't bother me as much as it does you because I've not even but thought anything, about the, the, it. Now, but on a wide body car, the proportion of everything is absolutely perfect, isn't it? Because the width versus the length versus the depth of the spoiler, it all works together. But on a narrow body car, to me, they always look a little bit over spoiled for the, for the girth. Would you go wide at the rear with a spoiler, but then have narrow wings or would you just... I'd just go wide at all the things. Just every car should be wider every yeah. car should have wide arches for me that's just a, a general thing there's no car in the world that doesn't look better with wide arches think of delta integrale better with wide arches think of when evo 4 went to evo 5 better with wide arches think of 22b from impressa type r better with wide arches e36 m3 well, yeah someone should have done it but then you know e30 m3 better than an e30 there is no car in history that's ever been made that doesn't look better when the factory i'll caveat it with that <laughs> i was gonna say yeah i was just thinking of your calibre oh my calibre looks better with wide arches because it looks like a dtm car yeah it does it does so there, and i've got that kershaw golf that looks better with wide arches just everything oh, yeah yeah everything looks better with wide arches it should just stuck be... in the 80s that's no bad thing though is it because the 80s have suddenly become incredibly cool so the tea tray, the whale tail. Yes. So the whale tail is basically the thinner, slimmer one, and this is the tea tray because this has to house the intercooler, doesn't it? This actually has a job to do. It's not just providing downforce and function. This is shoveling air in and keeping the charge cool. Shall we have a look at the engine? Pop the, uh, pop the hood. It's your side. Oh, it is my side, isn't it? Because they never changed that. The cheap bastards. <laughs> not only did they not put the wiper delete on, but they still kept this on the German driver's side. And there is said intercooler. Oh, it's an aircon car as well. There is actually, because um, I did have a backdated one of G series Targa that I sold, and um, the aircon pump had given up, so it had a retro kit on it, which was better than the standard and considerably cheaper. Was it really? But it was still two and a half grand, I think. Or well, that was like it. That. When I looked at the bits to replace everything on mine, and it came to about four grand, and I just thought, you know what? It's a convertible. You just put the roof down if you're too hot, do you? Yeah, I know. It's completely pointless. <laughs> There's not a great deal to see that's in That's the them, thing about there. the 911. Of all the engines in all the classic cars in all the world, that's not the prettiest, is it? They perform a function and they do it very well, but... And the old air cooled are just... It's very reminiscent of the Beetle, isn't Well, everything's it? in the same place, even where yeah. the distributor sits. I mean, there's no way that anyone that's ever looked at a flat four engine in a Beetle and looked at that cannot see the relationship. There is a huge relationship, yeah. And obviously the fans at the front rather than in the big shroud at the back, but it's pretty much everything's in the same place, isn't it? But it's just the, the fact that they had to have this boot lid for the intercooler. What, as in to physically fit over it? <laughs> yeah. But that's like defined the style of the car, hasn't it? Yeah. That's the thing. And becomes such an iconic thing. So Johnny, 911 purists would argue that when the 993 finished and the 996 came along and the car gained radiators, it just all went to bits. I think there's a charm of air cooled. I think there's a huge charm. I think to me... Oh the yeah, there is song. a huge charm because it's a... It's a such a recognisable sound, isn't it? Yeah. You knew when there was a Beetle coming. Yeah. And you knew when there was a Metro or a Mini coming. It's true. Not because of the engine noise, it was because of the gearbox one from the Metro and the <laughs> Mini, wasn't it? But they were awful. But yeah, the, the, the air-cooled sound is very unique, isn't it? But if we're looking at cars with S, so narrow body or wide body, coupe or convertible, air-cooled or water-cooled, if you're looking for cars to drive, what, if you, what would be your realistic dream spec? If you're looking for a great car to drive, what should you get? Uh, can I go water cooled? Would you? Would you go 996? I tell you, I tell you something. Because they are great to drive, aren't they? Because they feel very analog. 996 turbos are great yeah. to drive, and they are starting to come of age now. Your dream spec would be a water cooled 996. No, it's not my dream spec. No. A dream I'm affordable good. spec, though. But do you think a the... affordable definitely? Because if you look at the value of the the turbos for a nice proper turbo, you can you can get a 930 turbo now for maybe 80s. Yeah, well, this one's 110. This is particularly nice, this car. But then, it? a good, uh, probably about four years ago, had a Grand Prix white car with a four speed box, so the 915 gearbox. Yeah. That had done 27, 
thousand ish miles and we've got 120,000 for that. Wow. So the value's always been there. They dip back a little bit, but then... But they got stupidly expensive for a while. I think they had to call off, didn't they? But now they seem to have settled. But then if you've got, say, for example, the LEs, which I think they only made about 50 of those for the UK market. Yeah. Or maybe worldwide. I you know, I think the there's only about 13 of this model left, a 1989 five-speed 930 cab. This is mental, yeah. It's Th this is rare, is 13 it? cars in the UK. Super rare and particularly lovely if you do want one. But is, this, think, is this your dream spec? Yeah, this would be my dream spec. In terms of investment cars, do you think the money's going to stay in the air-cooled cars more than the water-cooled cars? Because I think it will. No, I just think they'll all go. Do you think? Yeah, I, I do. There, there's a certain charm for both. Um, 996 turbos, as I discussed, were a bit unloved. Yeah. Um, but the values of those, they got down to 30s. But if water-cooled is so great, why aren't Singer doing it? In a million-pound car, why is it air-cooled? Because... People are a bit ah, more... You have no response for that, do you? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up and I was thinking, yeah, I need to think of something good here. <laughs> and your answer is? Uh, because uh, people with more money are older and they're reliving their youth. That's what it is. That's what it is. And you're down with kids, so you'll have a radiator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Them radiators are like, well good, isn't it? <laughs> These newfangled radiators, never catch on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a plumber. What do you think of convertibles? Because... I like them. I know they don't drive as well as the coupe, but to me, this car, I mean, these days you can't drive that fast anyway, can you? You can't really go absolutely flat out down the country lane. And I know these scuttle shake, particularly with a wide body car, because they really twist, don't they? Because there's so much rear track, it, you can actually feel it, even on a very good car. I've got an 82 car, and it's California, the shell is mint. So I know there's no structural rot, but you can you just you feel, feel it. Flop, it. You yeah. feel it flopping about all over the place. But that was always the thing, you, you, you chop off the roof, and you just lose all the structural integrity of the mm. shape of the car, But don't it you? looks really cool. Yeah, it looks cool, but as I say, it doesn't matter with the car, and unless you modify yours and you want to go up against a modern car and race it. Just drop the roof and enjoy it for what it is. But that's the thing, that's the joy of these cars for me. Lovely day like today, you drop the roof, you find a nice country lane, and Still you sit Still 300 there. brake. It's fast enough, isn't it? It's all you, all you need. But this has a very nice interior. We should admire the interior together on this one. So First of all, immaculate, utterly immaculate. You've got short throw gear lever. The only thing I think I'd change is the non-correct period stereo. If I was doing this for me, I think I'd find a late 80s blab. A Toronto, I think, would look good in there. Whack a Toronto in there, that would look good. You know so much stuff about stereos, don't you? <laughs> period stereos. Well, they just finished a car, don't you think? Yeah, I, I do. That's, that's probably been put in there since the 90s. I think that's a 90s uh, update that was yeah. right for the time. And it didn't jar at the time. If you saw in the 90s, a 90s stereo and an 80s car, it looked okay. Yeah. There's something now to me, every car from the period should have a stereo from that period. See, this has got, so this is marine blue leather and then the car's Baltic blue. Um, but the seats aren't that blue, are they? No, they're almost black, like a very dark grey. Mm. Very Germanic, this car, isn't it? But they're heated, lumber, electric lumber support. It, they were very basic inside, weren't they? I mean, it's got electric windows, and, but it, it was what it was. It's all you need, isn't it? But again, this car is just a great lesson in putting in a car all that you need and nothing more. But in terms of whilst we're talking about the seats, from a buyer's point of view, especially the cloth seats have really become worn, get a lot of bolts to wear. I mean, you get a tiny little bit, even if you're trying to be careful and you've got a low mileage car, just naturally because of the way that you climb into the car, sometimes you have to dump yourself in and you rub against the bolster. So it yeah. will get a bit of wear I mean, on what it. you're talking about now, is this when you're dogging, is this sort of exacerbated wear that you see during your special time? <laughs> God, why do you keep doing this to me? Back to the serious point of uh, Porsches. If you were looking for what I would call a proper Porsche, an air-cooled Porsche, Let's have a, a quick buyer's guide. What should you look out for? What are good models to go for? What sensible entry points? And what are the possible problems, Johnny? Possible problems with a turbo, essentially walk away from anything with a smoky engine. If it's if blue smoke under boost or just idling, if it's running lumpy, you've got issues. There could be a plethora of issues with either the, the turbo, the head, just so many things. Fortunately, with the G-series cars, it doesn't matter if it was a Carrera or a Turbo or whatever it was, they suffered massively with rot. Um, you can't really 
appreciate how much rot there is. Because it's, because it's so it's hidden, hidden, isn't it? Yeah. So you, and you really, have to take panels off to really see. You don't have you? to really take the front wings off to see the inner wings to see the extent of it. Yeah, it's, it's really the, the the biggest bugbear of a G series car is the rot. So my advice would be, if anyone is thinking of getting one, so I've got one. Mine's a California car, and that's a cliche, but there's a reason why it's a cliche because if you buy a car from Arizona, if you buy a car from California, any of the dry states, they're just generally in much better condition. You have to do things like replace the hood because they're generally a bit threadbare because the sun's killed them. Same with the interior, like the leather on my car is incredibly brittle because yeah. the sun's had it, but I'd rather be retrimming a car at 1,600 quid than putting panels across the whole thing. Yeah, so just to do the, f the front seats and uh, in so a, a turbo, you could be looking at eight, 900 pounds per seat to have someone do it properly. Your land's very expensive. If you want the proper leather. I go to Dave Hayden in Brummate, he's a proper old boy. Oh, I'm name dropper. 600 quid. You're on the backhander. What do I, Dave? Yeah, I'll do that. 600 quid. 600 quid for 1600. two? 1600. For two? No, for the whole lot. Oh, okay, including the rears. Mm. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Keep it real. All right. I made the money now. The other great place I've been buying cars from recently through a very good friend of mine is uh, Scandinavia. Because even though obviously it isn't oh dry God, in Scandinavia. It just sobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not just sobs, but he's bought a lovely 930 actually, a 930 from Sweden, but because they don't salt. Basically what kills cars in this country, and the reason I'd hardly ever buy a British car, is because the salt absolutely kills them. The, I think the G-Series were, weren't they zinc coated from factory to, to help prevent rot? Still but, rot though, don't they? Yeah, they, they really, really did. did. It's quite funny when people say, oh, there's, uh, I've got a the turbo or the Carrera and there's absolutely no rot, it's original condition, it's like, well, if you ask most specialists, um, so a friend of mine, David Lane from Workshop 77, he does a lot of resto mods. Name dropper. Yeah, I was name dropping, I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I did that on purpose. Yeah, so uh, uh, when people say they've got a car without rot, it's no. Take it apart. It might have been dry stored or the rest of it, but Nowadays, our preparation is very different. So if you do bare metal a car and you take it right back and you, you build it up with the newer modern products, fingers crossed, you should be good. Because people say to me, when I say, look, buy a car from a country like Scandinavia, buy a car from a country like America where they're dry, they don't have rot, and people go, well, I don't want to drive left-hand drive. And I would say it's much quicker and easier to get used to driving a left-hand drive car over here because it'll take you a <laughs> few days then to restore one, don't you reckon? I think you feel comfortable in a left-hand drive car in no more than a week. You cannot restore a car in a week. It's, the, it's by far the easiest thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's, drive a, it's a very British backwards way of thinking where people are like, oh, I'd never have a left-hand drive car. It's actually quite quirky and quite fun, isn't it? Over half the stuff I've got is left-hand drive. Is it? Yeah, over half of it, because it's generally imported, because I, I hate doing bodywork. I don't mind doing repaints and respaints. <laughs> that, that is such a lazy way to well, have so a car just, Why is it lazy? Because you put import like, oh, stuff I that's can't be bothered to do a car. I can't be bothered so to spend thousands restoring it. So I just buy left hand drive one because it's rush free. That's just smart. That's what that is. That's just saving time and money. I hope you're going to move abroad. But then, that's the thing. All, then your whole plans will come but to this fruition. Is the thing. So when I've sold left hand drive cars in the past, which is very rare because as you know, I don't sell anything. But then people in France buy them, people in Germany buy them, so your potential market when you come to sell on, if you've bought a car from America, you've done the hard part, you've bought it back to mainland Europe. So then of course then everybody can just stick it on a boat or stick it on a tunnel, you get France, Germany, Spain, Italy, all those countries then are your potential marketplace. And it's so much easier if it's left That is boat. true. And then and one of the things about stocking cars to sell, when people would say about left-hand drive cars, that is where it had such a market. So the one that we backdated, that was originally a Californian car mm. uh, that someone that we knew bought it off eBay. It was imported to the UK, all backdated and done the work on it, and then ended up selling it to a guy in Paraguay. Really? Yeah, and it was a left-hand drive car. Yeah. So it was just you open up the market. So I do agree on that bit. So that would be my advice. If you do fancy one, get a left-hand drive one. Learn to drive it in the UK. It's not as hard as you think. No. You can't overtake as easily, but just get a mate to sit next to you. They can tell you when it's clear. Unless they're a real risk taker. <laughs> yeah, just do it. <laughs> just go for it. You can beat this truck. <laughs> That's what you do. This whole series is Meet Your Heroes, isn't it? And this is one of my childhood heroes. I had posters of this car on my wall as a little kid. And I would say this is probably the nicest turbo I've ever driven in terms of condition and spec. The first thing we've got to talk about is the complete lack of scuttle shake. This car does not flex at all, does it? This car no. is very, very rigid for a convertible. 
Maybe because this car hasn't got any rot. It's just lovely, isn't it? And of course, non-power assisted steering, but that doesn't feel too heavy. It just feels really nicely weighted. Because this car, I think, had a really unfair reputation. Didn't These were always called the Widowmakers, and although they sorted them out a little bit on the later cars, I mean, a lot of it is just down to how you drive them, isn't it? Yeah, it is down to how you drive them, but... I mean, if you come on and off the throttle in silly places in the middle of a corner, it's going to bite you. So what does the Porsche 911 mean to you? I think as a turbo, to me, this has got to be my top 10 cars of all time. A 911 needs to be in my collection. I need to have one. Yeah. I don't care if it's a G series, a 996, a 997. I just need the first one. Because they are amazing things, aren't they? But they're so basic. Like the dashboard really looks and feels quite dated. For an 80s car, this feels almost more like a kind of 70s dashboard, doesn't it? Which is what it is. I mean, you think you're, you're nearly in the 1990s at this point, and that's your gauge pack, that's your layout. But what I love about Porsche is their utter refusal to change anything about the basic design of this car for pretty much from the original launch in the 60s all the way through but to the late 90s. Yeah, but they got it right. Yeah. They got it right. It, very simplistic. Yes, the dashes didn't change. Even through 964s were quite shallow dashes as well, weren't they? Because you do see it very close to the windscreen in relation to how modern cars are. I think anybody that's never driven one of these before who gets into it will feel that they're incredibly close to everything. The windscreen, the doors, the controls. You can but reach that, everything. You can, you can literally touch the windscreen, which is unheard of in a modern car, isn't it? You can't do that. But that's the charm of this car, it wraps around you. That's why when you're driving one quickly, they just feel very, very costing and they do feel like a part of you, don't they? Let's talk about this particular car then. If you were in the lucky position to have £110,000 in your bank account, this car's done 71,000 miles. It's exceptionally well history. It's in incredible condition. And I can't imagine this driving any better when it was brand new. Are you enjoying it? Oh, I just absolutely love it. I love driving any old 911, but a wide body turbo cab, this is the absolute dream. This is, this is me, aged 13, 14. This is the car I wanted this exact car I even like the colour Baltic blue yeah it's just gorgeous isn't it and it's so smooth so refined I mean if you wanted a car you'd want this one wouldn't you this actual car that's for sale £110,000 seems like an awful lot of money one of 13 cars but what an inherently usable classic something that you can use every nice day every summer day it's got aircon to even I was just about to say it's got factory fitted aircon climate control nonetheless I mean, how expensive must that have been in the 80s? This is why I like Meet the Heroes, because in Meet the Heroes, we get to meet the cars that we literally lusted after when we were kids, the cars that we thought were genuinely heroic. And you get into this car, and this is a particularly nice example, isn't it? This yeah, one? it's great. And I just think this, if you ever wanted one as a child, if you ever grew up during your formative years thinking, I want a turbo wide body cab, just, just drive one, just go and have a go in once. Just find a dealer that will let you have a go. Get your finance in order. Because certain things in life are worth getting finance payments for, aren't they? But you think as well, a lot of these cars though, so there's some beautiful cars at Sasa, you've got Ferraris, you've got things like ISOs in there, incredible cars, but if we're honest, if we're realistic, you've almost got to build up to the day that you take that car out, you've got to make sure it's serviced, make sure it's conditioned, there's probably a load of things you've got to do on periodic servicing like cam belts or chains, so that those cars take a lot of upkeep because they're so fragile, relatively speaking, that you just can't jump in them and drive them. Where this no. in your collection, stick it on a battery conditioner, service it once a year, MOT it once a year, you know you're just gonna be able to jump in and start it and drive off because that's what 911s do, isn't it? The everyday supercar, and they always have been, haven't yeah. they? And they're not as, you know, they're not especially fast. I mean, a GR Yaris would waste this on pretty much any piece of road you care to mention. GR Yaris would not waste most of Yeah, <laughs> but if you want to feel special, and sort of recapture an amazing time. This is the car to do it in, isn't it? Would you get rid of your flat nose to get this? If it was a straight swap, I probably would, you know. But you couldn't bring yourself to put 30, 40,000 quid into it. I don't know, I don't know. So to sum this up then, Johnny, if you had 110,000 pounds and you the market, would you buy this particular hero? Uh, for me, no, I would. I would go and put it into a 9964, nine, more than likely a 993. Would you really? Yeah, I really would. That's interesting. Well, I would, having driven this and on a beautiful sunny day on these wonderful roads up in Beverley, 
I would own this. Bevel air, if Bentley. They had, if they had the fun and the funds, I would own this. Yeah, I think I would. Uh, I do love G Series cars. I really do. But I feel ultimately I would take that 110,000 and put it into a 993 turbo. So we hope you've enjoyed that little look at one of my personal heroes. This car, if you're quick, if you are clever, and subscribe and ring that notification bell so you see our videos when they come out, this car is for sale. It's £110,000 at Sasso Automotive. It is practically faultless. And if you do want one, you want this one. So like, subscribe, hit the bell, join us next time. Of course, if you want some sweet merch, go to BeFaster.com and you too could look as good as Johnny. They couldn't, could they? Thank <laughs> you.